Thank you very much. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Manuel Caballo. He's an advisor, a technical advisor to the ECDC, to the Council of Europe, of course WHO, and also to UNAID, nothing else. He's an epidemiologist. I will make it short. Forgive me, because we are like behind schedule. But he has been a key person on the global program on AIDS. And then more recently, he has coordinated major studies on the impact of migration on the epidemiology of viral hepatitis, on, uh, sorry, on migration and diabetes, on the impact of war on maternal and child health. And the last results, he will tell you himself. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, almost good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I had a professor who said there was advantages and disadvantages of being the last speaker. Um, the disadvantage was that everything that was worth saying has already been said, and I think this morning we had a great, rich discussion. Uh, the advantage is that by the time you come to speak, everyone's so tired they're not listening anyway. Um, now, I will um, go very quickly through this, and um, if I can. Now, I'm going to try to contextualize a lot of what I'm going to talk about. And I think in the area of migration, we must be very careful as to what we say, what we believe, and we must also be very careful not to extrapolate too much from what few data we have. This is an area characterized by poor research, little research, and on the whole, by misunderstandings. This morning, we've heard a lot of people talk about migrants are healthy. Why? How do we know that? We don't know. We assume that because people are young, and we have media ages of about 28 mentioned this morning, that they are relatively healthy, and one would expect that. We can also assume that at the age of 28, they have survived childhood, adolescence, and hence are, quotes survivors. But we should never assume too much in terms of the experience that people go through and how this covers uh, their health. Um, 2015 uh, has been referred to as the year of the great migration, the crisis migration to Europe. Um, it's an interesting thing how hysterical the response to 2015 migration was. At one point during that period, the European Union asked all countries to take 60,000 migrants, <coughs> and if they did do that, it would reduce, mitigate, solve the problem. Most countries refused to take 60,000, saying that that could not be handled. Every Sunday, every country, every city has a football stadium that is filled with more than 60,000 people who are handled in two hours to go in and two hours to come out. Uh, it was hysteria. Now, the other thing that we must remember whenever we're talking about migration and migrants is that migrants are coming to a continent that demographically is dying. And we must make no bones about this. It is a dying continent. Fertility rates have now fallen uh, well below um, the, the point of replenishment, and if the European region does not make up for that fall with migrants, then most of the economic structure of Europe will fail over the next 50 years. That is something that demographers will say, and some economists will say, most politi politicians will refuse to believe. Now, there's been mention of the complexity of this process, and I will try not to use the word migrant, and I will try to use the word or the term people on the move. Because here we have 
a, a list of all the people who are on the move. These are different categories of people. These are people going through different types of experiences. These are people who are more or less, or in some cases not at all, supported by international regulations, conventions, and, and so on. Now, I just want to highlight this figure down at the bottom. The largest number of people moving today are tourists. Tourists are exposing themselves, and do expose themselves, to infectious diseases at a very high rate. In Geneva, where I am based, the, one of the highest incidences of sexually transmitted infections is returning tourists. So we should never forget that there is this huge industry of population movement which is accelerating and introducing new challenges in terms of public and clinical health. Now, Migration or population movement has always been seen and feared as one of the vectors, one of the reasons for the movement of disease. In the 14th century, in Milan and Dubrovnik and Venice, people were very sensitive to this and introduced for the first time the idea of quarantine and quarantine of ships for 40 days in case uh, there was an introduction of bubonic plague. So let's start with bubonic plague. Bubonic plague has, in fact, historically been moved extensively by people. Um, and today, um, unfortunately, it is a very rare disease. There were seven cases um, recorded in the United States in 2017, all in the area of New Mexico, where we know plague is relatively endemic. So plague does not constitute a cause for concern today um, in, in, with regard to people on, on the move. Now, then, what about smallpox? Smallpox, the great killer, um, was in fact moved <coughs> extensively by just about everybody that did move. And perhaps one of the greatest movements of smallpox was related to the movement of crusaders in Europe moving backwards and forwards from the North African uh, region, uh, and of course, taking it, bringing it, mixing it, and spreading it. Um, fortunately, eradicated, so this is no longer a cause for concern in the context of infectious diseases and population movement. So, what about yellow fever? Yellow fever was one of the dreaded diseases in the United States. It was the yellow fever uh, introduction and outbreaks that caused the United States to create its public health system and its screening system of people arriving in the United States. Um, mosquito spread originated in Africa, possibly West Africa, but moved very extensively, taken to the Americas and brought to Europe as, as a result of the slave trade. So you don't get anything for nothing, you have to pay for it somehow. Um, now, um, a problem still in sub-Saharan Africa, um, but in, uh, in, in Europe, not a problem. There was just one case of a Dutch tourist who acquired yellow fever in 2017 uh, on a trip to uh, Africa. So what about tuberculosis? Like smallpox, tuberculosis has been one of the most feared diseases of immigration authorities. Um, and again, it has been moved by people, and there are some theories that it was moved zoonotically from Europe to the Americas by seals. That's the real seals, not the Navy seals that you hear about in the American military. Uh, although that could have been the case too. Um, now, Tuberculosis has a number of characteristics that we have to be aware of. It is, for me, the classic disease of poverty. Tuberculosis is associated with poor housing, with overcrowding, with poor nutrition, and poor access to good ventilation. A few years ago, I was invited to a uh, meeting in Canada that was called Tuberculosis in First 
world populations. First world populations, indigenous populations. So there were people from all over the world. After three days of intensive discussion, the recommendation was made by all the TB experts was improve housing. So this is something to be borne in mind when we're thinking about this. Tuberculosis is easily preventable, increasingly manageable, except for multidrug resistant TB, which unfortunately is becoming more problematic in the context of population uh, movement. But it is a disease that we must be very careful with in the context of population movement for the very reasons that the last speaker was saying and other speakers have said. What happens to people on the way, and more particularly what happens when they arrive in Brussels? So, more common in migrants than in non-migrants, very significantly so in Europe, but it's easy to say it is a complex picture. It is not all migrants, particular migrants, where they come from, socioeconomic background, and where they're living in Europe. So what about cholera? Another scary disease, another disease that humanitarian workers are accosted with regularly. Waterborne, early outbreaks in India, recorded outbreaks in India, um, but probably recorded as well in parts of Europe. But we can see that with the arrival of the colonial forces of the UK, they, they took as well as they, um, um, they moved it throughout Southeast Asia uh, and into the Pacific. Now, it remains a problem where there is not clean drinking water, <coughs> access to clean drinking water, and good sanitation. I don't know whether you can see this picture clearly. This is a holding center for migrants in 2017 in Hungary. So, when we think of distant lands, when we think of how terrible it is to live in Africa or Afghanistan, um, we're not much better and we handle migration very, very badly in Europe. So, now, what about syphilis and gonorrhea? And here we come into the wonderful uh, area of theorizing, did Columbus take it, or did he bring it back? <laughs> the, the issue is it really doesn't matter. It became a major problem. Syphilis was the HIV AIDS of yesterday clearly moved around by military personnel, and there are very good data from the Boer War, the war of, in South Africa, where the reason, the, the most important reason for not being able, not being fit for duty, was syphilis. So syphilis put more soldiers out of action than war injuries and other instances related to military endeavors. Um, so, interestingly, syphilis and gonorrhea are significantly higher in non-migrant populations in Europe than in migrant populations. Now, this may tell us something about culture, about ethnicity, about religious background, of cohesion, or lack of cohesion, or whatever. But it is an interesting finding that has many implications for how we look at this, uh, this problem. Now, and then we come, after the bubonic plague, Spanish flu, which wasn't Spanish at all, um, killed more people around the world than any other disease. Probably orig originated on a chicken farm in Kansas, um, at a time when young men were being dramatically recruited to come to Europe for the First World War. They went to holding centers on the east coast of the United States. One of these fellows got too close to a chicken and got the flu. Um, now, the interesting thing is that here we have perhaps the best documented movement of a mass 
infectious disease killer. A very well documented, not very well understood. Um, more recently with H1N1, which was first reported in New Mexico and probably did originate in New Mexico uh, and spread very, very quickly, as you recall, because uh, I can speak to all of you as saying it's probably in your lifetime. There are a few things that have happened in your lifetime, my lifetime, but that's one of them. Um, so, influenza is an annual problem. It is one we talk about every year. It is, in many respects, preventable. New strains of influenza will be moved by people on the move. And, of course, the best example of that was SARS, where someone who was already infected with SARS went to Hong Kong, sneezed while he was in a, an elevator, and infected everybody else in the elevator. 24 hours later, SARS had moved from Hong Kong to Canada. So here we have an extraordinary example of the speed with which population movement can, tran can translate into a massive uh, change in, um, uh, in public health. So, rapidly moved, difficult to manage, in all likelihood will repeat itself in other forms in the coming years. So what about HIV AIDS, uh, the one that everybody at one point was afraid of? Clearly again, a disease that was moved by, with people, at a speed which is very, very difficult to understand given that it is not airborne. This is a disease that is passed really through close contact. And the extent to which HIV AIDS was moved from rural, let's say DRC, to urban Kinshasa, and from urban Kinshasa elsewhere, is probably one of the most remarkable phenomena in public health and one that we still do not fully understand. A friend of mine was a person who identified so-called Mr. X, but many years later we understood he really wasn't Mr. X. There were many Mr. Xs. Um, but it was indicative of how quickly and how concerned we had to be as to the way, the route of transmission, the speed of transmission, and the pre predictability of transmission. So, um, some migrants, some migrants more at risk than non-migrants. And there are certain countries and certain cities in Europe where very clearly, quote, newcomers are the ones who are at risk. But HIV AIDS is a very complex disease. There are different strains. And depending on how you interact with other people sexually is going to define the type of HIV strain that you have. So this also complicates the picture. But people coming from countries with a high prevalence of HIV seem to be more likely to acquire HIV in the country of resettlement. The interesting point is, and I should have mentioned this with TB as well, today one of the causes of HIV in Central American countries is the return of migrants from the United States. So they have acquired HIV in the United States. A reminder that population movement and the passage of infectious diseases is a bilateral phenomenon. It is not unidirectional. And this is something that we must always keep in mind. Um, and by the way, when I say I should have mentioned with DB, one of the things if we had immigration officials here today, they would say, we screen for TB. 
And there are some countries like the United States and Canada, um, and certainly the Gulf countries, that depend on migration or migrant workers for their survival, screen, do what is called pre-migration screening. So if I want to go to the United States as an immigrant, I'm told to go to a doctor here who is certified by the United States, I will be tested for TB. If I have it, I'm not allowed to go. I could, and I could maybe go in for treatment and then reapply in six months or whatever. What we are seeing is that people who were screened negative develop TB in the six to twelve months post-arrival in the countries that they migrate to. And this is very interesting because earlier on I said TB is a classic disease of poverty and in fact what we are seeing is that migrants tend to settle together with other migrants in highly overcrowded tenements, settlements, uh, with a very, very low quality of life. And some of them who had latent TB infection, and this is something, again, that is not screened for, latent TB infection is reactivated or is activated. <coughs> so we have a very, very curious and, and very frightening proposition with regard to TB uh, being activated or acquired after migration. So, and then we have measles, which everyone is talking about these days because we've learned that uh, autism is caused by measles vaccination. Um, so, um, but measles again moved around the world uh, by, uh, probably by explorers from, from Europe. The main thing is, I think that, and here we come to this new, this concept that I like to talk about, of the geometric centrifugal uh, spread. There are some diseases that for whatever reason spread very quickly and in an unfocused way. They move centrifugally. Anybody in the area is affected uh, by them. So today, fortunately, vaccination is the answer. Unfortunately, we really do not know to what extent people on the move are able to get their children vaccinated. When I worked in Bosnia during the war, one of the worst, one of the biggest questions we had was what do you do about measles vaccination when you have a population of children who you don't know whether they were vaccinated against measles. And their parents don't. And they don't have medical certificates. So we have here a conundrum. Vaccination against measles is going down rather than up. And we are already seeing the results of that with measles outbreaks and increasing cases of mortality related to, to, to measles. So, uh, low incidence in migrants, um, and un unfortunately, vaccine preventable. Now, HPV. HPV <coughs> is something that is, I, I think, relatively new to the public health field. Viral hepatitis A, B, and C. Uh, when we did our first studies looking at migration and HPV, there was very little evidence, very few studies uh, at, that, at that time. HPV, which is more easily transmitted, far more easily and efficiently transmitted than HIV, is just as dangerous, if not more dangerous. Today, fortunately, it is a vaccine-preventable disease. Our studies of HPV in Europe <coughs> indicate that very, very few migrant populations have access or are considered for HPV uh, vaccination. And if we were to talk about HPV treatment and then go to the more dramatic brother, HCV, that causes cancer of the liver and, and, and is very, very serious, many public health officials will say, we have a treatment, it is too expensive for a migrant population, for a new population. So here we have a new emerging 
cause for concern. Now, um, then I want very quickly to just say, what has happened around the world? Well, I was fascinated, there is a book called The Fatal Shore, Shore, S-H-O-R-E, when Britain began to send prisoners who had stolen an apple or a piece of bread to Australia, a voyage that took three to four months, the world view of the average Englishman was 17 miles. Probably the distance that you could either walk or ride by horse in a day. So our worldview has changed. The speed with which we sail and certainly that we fly now introduces a totally different panorama for infectious diseases. When I can go from Australia to London now in 19 hours, as they did non-stop last week, it means that I can acquire a serious infection in Australia without any symptomatology. I can get on the plane. I can get to Brussels. And it will be a few weeks later before there are any symptoms. At the time that the health authorities of Dubrovni said that boats coming in to the bay should be quarantined for 40 days. That was because of the 40 days they estimated that bubonic plague would present itself. Today we don't have that luxury. So rapid rapidity of, my, of population movement is going to introduce new challenges for infectious disease management. and will produce new permutations. And I think this is going to be the real challenge. New permutations. So at a time when we're beginning to understand the correlationship between tuberculosis and diabetes, think about the different correlations that we're going to see between different infectious diseases. A very frightening panorama. Um, now, what about distance? Well, this is an early map of the world. Um, so when you had people thinking of the world in that way, very, very centrifugal, I'm going to tell you, I'm just, I'm going to take two minutes to tell you a funny story. <laughs> a friend of mine was a medical officer in the Pacific many, many years ago. And the chief medical officer who was based in Manila kept writing to him and saying, you are not meeting your expected vaccination rates on the island that you're based on. And he would write back and say, sorry sir, the chief will not let me vaccinate the children. And the chief medical officer would say, get off the ash, you've got to do it. And finally this interaction went on for about a year and finally my friend said he wrote to the chief medical officer and said, Come and do it yourself. Show me. <laughs> so the chief medical officer, who told this story himself afterwards, thought, how am I going to do this? And sitting in his office, he looked at the wall, and he realized he had this big map of the world. And he took it down, he rolled it up, and when he sailed to this little island, because he was the chief medical officer, they gave a big party for him that night, and he said they were all sitting on the grass, on the floor, drunk on palm wine, and he said, this is the moment. And he went and he took this map from his cabin, brought it out, and he rolled it on the floor, and he kneeled on the map, and he put his hand on the, Ameri on the United States, says, this is America. And he looked at the chief, and he said, and here the chief says, vaccinate all the children. And then he moved to Australasia, did it the same with Australia. He said, here the chief says, vaccinate all the children. And he did it with Europe. And then he took out a pencil, and he took up a knife and he made a really fine point on the pencil and he kneeled and he put it down in the middle of the Pacific. And he looked up very dramatically and he said, and here the chief says, don't vaccinate the children. And he said, the chief got up very slowly, he said, he was huge, he didn't realize how big he was until he came. 
and he put his foot on the pencil and snapped it. And he looked down and he said to the chief medical officer, who drew this map? So, it's again, it's indicative that how we view the world, how we view our own role and position in the world, is going to influence what we look for in terms of infectious diseases. Uh, the head of WHO many, many years ago, Houghton Muller, was, I think, one of the first to coin this concept of the global village from a public health uh, perspective. But today, um, we have a very, very new uh, panorama of, of the infectious disease opportunities and, again, new permutations. So, what should we be thinking about? What should we be worried about? Well, the first, and I think other people have mentioned this, is where we come from. So if we come from there, we can assume, we must assume, that there has been an exposure to certain infectious diseases of concern. I mean, you look at that. Look at that. Hmm? So where people come from, which is usually a reflection of socioeconomic status, of education, of access to clean water, and sanitation and so on, we must begin to profile according to where people come from. It is not enough to say they come from Africa or they come from Latin America. We have to be much more precise and begin to pinpoint these areas. So, medical histories that reflect that socioeconomic environment. Now, and then we come to the question of, I went too fast there, transit. Now, I'm going to look at this picture here these people have been in that room for seven months. These are, quotes illegal migrants in detention centers in Libya. This is paid for by the European Union. They will give Libya no matter how much money they want in order to keep them there and prevent them getting on a boat to Europe. This picture down here is on the Texas-American border, Mexican border, and look how similar it is. So we are not learning, we are retrogressing. We are regressing in terms of how we manage people caught in transit situations. So transit conditions must be considered with precision in terms of potential exposure to uh, infectious diseases. And finally, where do they end up? Well, we have talked about population movement throughout today, and we will continue to, in terms of people moving between countries. And I think the last speaker talked about internal migration. Internal migration is the biggest phenomenon. The Chinese government estimates that 3.5 million people move every month from countryside to city. The Indian government, that, who does not have precise data, says it's probably as much or more. Now, these people are moving into slum areas where the health conditions are worse than they were wherever they moved from. And this to the interest of everybody, is a photograph I've taken in the heart of Geneva, one of the wealthiest cities of Geneva, where I came across 17 migrants of different ages, including pregnant women, sharing two rooms. And every night, they flip a coin. And this is true. They flip a coin to see who will sleep in the bath. Because the bath is the only place in the two rooms where there is actual physical privacy. Now, from an infectious disease perspective, which is what I was asked to talk about, this and this are explosive situations. And we are lucky that we have not been faced with a new infection coming out of some of the migrant situations that we are putting people into. I, I, I'm very, I have to be, we have to be very careful. It is not 
it is not the person on the move. It's the locations that we are forcing them to move through. It's the locations that we are forcing them to live in when they get here. So if we really want to mitigate or reduce or prevent massive outbreaks, which we will have, of infectious diseases related to population movement, we have to revise our policies and our attitudes to what population movement is. And I come back to what I started out saying, Europe needs migrants desperately, desperately. And the worst thing that Europe is doing is not taking care of its migrants, because this is their lifeline. This is Europe's lifeline. So, just to come to an end, so is there a, a, a cause for concern? The main cause for concern is this. The number of conflicts around the world is not going down. The number of natural disasters is not going down. But the worst is going to be this. Climate change will probably, is predicted, to displace over 220 million people. So if we are worried about 60,000 people coming to Brussels and 60,000 to Antwerp, what are we going to do when we have 220 million people on the road looking for somewhere to go. So we are not paying enough attention to the health condition that people come from, where they transit, where they resettle. And a term that came up in the context of HIV AIDS, confidential counseling and testing. We should be developing massive programs of confidential counselling and testing of migrant populations for all diseases, including your mental health issues that you so eloquently talked about this morning. So, Susanna Jacob, who was the regional director for WHO in Europe, said uh, last year, again, very rightly, the diseases they might have are diseases that are already well established in Europe. And she was probably, to some extent, she was probably right. Not completely, but. <coughs> and she said we have very good prevention and control programs. And here, of course, she was wrong. Because we don't have good prevention and control programs. And if we did, we would be faced with all sorts of problems, including the political attitudes of Europe, which make it almost impossible today to provide equity in access to health care and quality health care. It's impossible. You cannot have this and this and this and at the same time be saying we treat our migrants as equals. And you could say, but the people who did this are not the people that are developing the healthcare system. You're, they're right. But if I was a migrant and I was walking past this every day, or this, which is, happens in Switzerland every time we have a referendum, I would say, there's no way I'm going to go to a hospital or to a primary healthcare, but, because this is what they think of me. So we have a very dangerous situation. On the one hand, we are acknowledging that there may be, may be, new permutations, new infectious diseases in populations that are not being counseled, are not being tested, and therefore are not being treated. A very, very big challenge awaiting Europe. Thank you.